this will be, I think, a very crammed lecture with a lot of tidbits of genotyping assays, assays because I'd like to finish that up before we move on to the next one, which we'll cover next-gen sequencing, or the beginnings of it. Um, quick review, we talked a lot about very big assays, right? Looking at very big sizes and, and changes, um, down to something that's rather small in terms of qPCR being about 70 bases, 80 or 90 bases, um, which is the Amplicon size. Um, the last lecture we talked about sizing assays and how you can use PCR combined with a high resolution detection method like capillotresis that you can get down to a one base pair change, either inserted or deleted, and be able to use that to do STR genotyping or short tandem repeat genotyping. Uh, another word for that is microsatellites. Everything I've talked about so far is actually looking at the DNA molecule at sort of a very macro level, right? We've, we've never been able to go down to the single base level, looking to see what it is. And that's usually what I mean about uh, by when I say genotyping, is that you'll be able to get information at the base level. So I haven't even talked anything about that. And that's what we're trying to cover today very quickly. There's quite a lot of methods, I think five or six of them. But the big ones I like to hit are Sanger sequencing, um, and snapshot. Uh, those are the two because those are kind of what we do today uh, in the lab uh, for the most part. And I'll try to very quickly gloss over the other ones uh, as a brief review and maybe uh, put the task on you to go and read more about them. Okay? Um, we'll first start out with something actually that's more archaic. Um, let's say I put you on some desert island <laughs> and I give you uh, two pieces of equipment. One is a gel electrophoresis box. Very cheap, right? Maybe you can pull some agar from the sea and you know, <laughs> extract your own agar and create these shells. Um, but then also give you a thermal cycler. So two things. Can you genotype uh, using just these two equipment? So a gel electrophoresis uh, box and a thermal cycler. If you can, then how, how can you do it? Let's say I, I allow you to uh, uh, have contact with the real world so that you can actually <laughs> order some oligos and some primers. <laughs> you can get primers that are specific right. for the sequence that has the, the specific uh, mutation, mutation or change you're looking for. So what uh, Daniel is talking about is allele-specific PCR. So this is one of the most simplest sort of method to look at uh, a genotype or sort of infer a genotype. So what Daniel's talking about is essentially if you have say a DNA uh, template that looks like this and you're looking for a mutation that looks like this. So here's your base change right here, right? A C to a G. So if this is five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, you could design a primer that anneals to this, so it would be the anti-sense of this or the complementary of this. This is gonna go on a little bit longer, a little bit longer. So, so far, these two primers look exactly the same, correct? And let's say you know, we move all the way down here, and there's some another primer uh, that will bind to the other strand, right, in this direction. So th this is going to be the same between the two of them. But this one can actually be a little specific. If you're looking for this mutation here, you could design it so that this anneals to the, the mutant, this anneals to the wild type, and you will get a very specific signature if you do these two reactions in two separate tubes. So if you're expecting a mutation to occur, then what you would have in terms of results is let's say you have a wild type specific uh, primer here and a mutant specific primer uh, there. These two tubes, you're going to load them onto your gel and run it. And let's say you designed it so that the product is roughly 200 bases uh, in length. Maybe on this well, you run your size standard, here's 200. Typically, if you have a germline condition, you 
probably will have a header's eyes condition perhaps, and you always detect a wild type band, right? And if you indeed have a mutation, and indeed this is able to prime the mutant allele, you'll also get a productive reaction in the second tube, and therefore also get a positive finding. So just by these, using these two apparatus, uh, apparati, I guess, uh, you have a thermal cycler that can do the PCR as long as you can order oligos that are specific for your allele, and then you have a gel electrophoresis system that can visualize the product of the band. So I mentioned that you can infer that there is this allele here because you're actually not looking for a C here. You, there's no physicality um, or physical signature or readout here that says it's a C, but because this is a C here binding to the or kneeling to the G, it produces a reaction with products that Indians tell you that yes, there was a C there or a G there in, in the mutant allele. Other folks do this a little bit more fancy. by doing something called crisscross PCR. So you can have, say, this is your allele here with the mutation or not. Let's say this is the wild type. So you could design a flanking primer like this. So this is a little bit skewed, right? You see how far along this one is and how closer this is to the, the mutation of a wild type spot. So in one direction, you would do a primer that's specific for the mutant. In the other direction, you do another primer here that's specific for the wild type. So you have essentially three PCR reactions going on. You have this one outside, which will amplify up the region that you're genotyping. You have this one that will only occur or work if you have a mutant allele being um, primed and amplified. And you will only have this one being productive if you have a wild type allele there, which usually should always be there. For cancer, for germline conditions, typically it's there, unless you have some homozygous uh, mutation. So you get three products, the very large one, the smaller one, and then the sort of medium-sized one. So when you run this on a gel or capillary trephesis, we'll draw that in a second, you get the large product, you get the small product, which is the wild, no, the mutant here, and then you get the medium product, which is the, uh, the wild type. So if you have absence of this, <coughs> That means you do not have the mutant around, and if you, um, let's say, don't have this around, then there's something weird going on, right? So that maybe you need to repeat the assay. So this is sort of an internal positive control for the region that you're trying to detect, and these are the two that are the sort of genotyping your assay. So on capillary rhesus, it'll just be, let's say you label all these primers, and you can do them in several colors if you wanted to, but you can really only just use one color because the sizing allows you another dimension to separate out what the, the primers are. So if I label all of these in some black color, for example, here, then you would just see something very similar to that on capillary trephesis. Much more sort of um, sensitive here. It uses capillary trephesis rather than gel electrophoresis. So a little specific, specific PCR can be rather sensitive um, as long as you have a detection method that um, that can, can detect, I think, you can get down to 1% sensitivity, even below 1%, maybe 0.1%, if you use enough cycles to amplify up uh, the, the, the target um, mutant or mutation that you're looking for. So compared to all the other assays, a little specific, specific PCR is quite, quite sensitive. So I'm going to take a step back and talk about another allele specific PCR assay, which is kind of like genotyping but it's a little bit off uh, because I, I need to cover it. And this is for looking at methylation. And we will circle back to Sanger, I promise you. <laughs> so this is for methylation. So in the sizing um, talk, I mentioned about MLH1 being methylated. So if you have MLH1 promoter methylation, what it does is it shuts off MLH1, leads to a loss of protein expression of MLH1, a concomitant loss of PMS2, and this is a condition generally associated with sporadic colorectal carcinoma, but can also be associated with Lynch syndrome. Another uh, gene that gets methylated is um, O6-methylguanine methyltransferase, or MGMT. You find this often in gliomas, uh, particularly uh, GBMs. They have a condition where the promoter of this 
is methylated. So these will be CG islands, CPG islands, that get methylated, which shuts off uh, transcription of MGMT, loss of protein expression of MGMT. And so if you have loss of MGMT, it's actually a good thing. Because these folks uh, get treated with an alkylating agent called timozolomide. It alkylinates the DNA to damage it. MGMT actually reverses that effect. So it's like counter counteracting against the, uh, the chemotherapy. So you don't want this around. So folks who have a methylated promoter is actually a good thing. So how do you detect a methylated C is basically what we're trying to genotype here in this case. So what you would do is take the DNA, so I, whether it's MLH1 or MGMT, the promoter at CG islands or CPG islands is methylated. So you take the DNA and do uh, a step called bisulfite treatment. This is done under basic conditions, heat, and then some other buffers and salts. And the combination of this actually changes a cytosine. A normal cytosine will get changed to a uracil. I think it's a process of deamination. I think that, that leads to this. The methylated C actually is protected and therefore remains a methylated C. So what you're doing in vitro, in this tube, is you're purposefully mutating the DNA to change a C to a uracil. What does a uracil look like on the DNA side? A thymine, yeah, thymine, or a T. Here, a uh, methylated C remains a methylated C, so now you've actually differentiated the two alleles, right? So what you imagine in your sample, which has some methylation around and maybe some wild type due to normal cell contamination, is you have CGs so this will be methylated this is unmethylated and in this tube when you do the bisulfite treatment it does not change this, this remains a C, methylated C this is changed to your cell And now you design two allele-specific primers. You see the difference here? One that recognizes the T, the uracil, which will be A here. And then the other one that recognizes the uh, original C, which is a G here. So I'll draw in some normal Cs as well. So this one might have some normal Cs around that do get uh, converted into a U. So you would account for those in your primer design. These C's, the same C's there would also get converted into U's. So you would design A's here if you were to extend the primer. But essentially this is an allele specific PCR step that will detect the methylated allele or the unmethylated allele. And you run this in two separate tubes and then you run it on gel or capillophoresis to detect positive. So it's very similar to what I just spoke about in terms of allele specific PCR. But we're using an intermediate step in terms of bisulfite treatment here to recognize what is methylated or not. The alternative strategy is you can actually put this into sequencing, like perhaps a Sanger sequencing method, although it's not very sensitive, or maybe perhaps pyrosequencing uh, to, to also detect the methylated islands. But most people tend to use the little spe specific PCR because it's sensitive and also it's rather cheap uh, to do. Alrighty, so that's allele-specific PCR applied to genotyping at the single base level. You could really design it also for a deletion too, like a small deletion, four base pairs. If you don't want to use sizing as a way to detect it, if you know that consistently the four base pairs are deleted, for example, nucleophosmin and AML, if you know that four nucleotides are always uh, deleted for some reason, or actually that's an insertion, then you can do a a allele-specific primer for those four inserted bases, and you'll be able to detect it that way by allele-specific PCR. A lot of times sizing is just so much easier to do, and it's, it's more sensitive because it can uh, actually detect any insertion or deletion, whereas allele-specific PCR would only detect that one that you're looking for. So it's like doing uh, fish, for example, right? Fish, you're looking for a very specific signature, so that's what allele-specific specific PCR is. So still going back, uh, old, old days, maybe 1975, um, early 1980s, actually it has to be early 1980s, because that's when PCR was discovered. 
Um, but things happened in 1975, and PCR got discovered in 1983. So around the mid-1980s, there's another method that um, is very cheap. You can probably do it on an island. So I give you access to an oligosynthesis company, a gel electrophoresis machine, and also um, a thermal cycler. And the fourth thing I give you access to is New England Biolabs. <laughs> <laughs> so what assay am I talking about? that can give you genotyping. Pretty old, still used. Yeah. So I want to say restriction. So restriction, restriction fragment length polymorphism. So restriction is because you're using restriction enzymes that you order from New England Biolabs. Fragment is because you're doing PCR and you're looking for differences, uh, uh, polymorphism in the fragment length. You get that? Restriction fragment length polymorphism. So polymorphisms are, they're just SNPs, or they are SNVs, or they're mutations, or they're changes that are different from reference or normal. And we're using this assay to detect that. Here's your template, here's your mutation, here's your primer that you designed, right? Let's make this a little bit more skewed, actually. Like that. And let's just say this is GATATC, for example. This is a 6-mer that is recognized by, I believe I, I remember this correctly, Equal R5, and you can order this from uh, New England Biolabs. So this enzyme will specifically recognize this, this sequence here and cleave it. I think it's a blunt end color, so it will cleave it right here in, in the center. So in 1975, these reagents were very important because they were the first reagents that allow um, molecular biologists to sort of do cut and pasting between different vectors and plasmas into clone genes, promoters, etc. So these were very important. And PCR just made things even better in terms of cloning because you can amplify up things very specifically. So the combination of those two used here is you do a PCR reaction. You can clean up if you want, but usually it doesn't really need, need uh, much cleanup because uh, PCR buffers are pretty amenable for uh, restriction digest. So you would do PCR, you would do a restriction uh, enzyme digest. And in this case, we're going to use uh, ECOR5. And then you would do a gel uh, analysis or gel extrapheresis. So if you have no mutations here, what you'll end up with is just do a gel, let's be cheap. You end up with two fragments, right? Like that. Let's say you do a non-cutting control as well. We draw this. So no cutting control, uh, positive cutting control. So here is a big band, two small bands like that. And if you have a mutation here, let's say a, a heterozygous mutation, that changes a, one of these bases. So here's a T10A, for example then now it renders this restriction site undigestible by the enzyme. This is a mutation of that site. And so what you'll end up with is these two small bands and also that original large size band. So there's a danger in this one assay here. Does anybody recognize this? Incomplete cutting. Right, incomplete cutting. Because it's an enzyme-based activity that requires uh, some optimal 37 degrees condition, requires you to have very clean DNA, probably not very much salts around or inhibitors around. So if you have incomplete cutting, you'll end up with a situation like this where it looks like a mutation, but really it's not. So you really need to make sure that you have complete digestion going on. So a trick that you can do is actually to tag one of your primers with a linker and add in this exact equal R5 site. So if you have incomplete cutting, what you'll see will be four bands, right? A very large one. So you can design this to be an extra 50 basis, for example. So you see a very large one up here. You see some intermediate cutting, and then those other two small ones, like that. But if you did have complete cutting, then this original large, the largest band would not be there, and that will help control for um, enzyme digestion conditions. Very cheap. Uh, restriction enzymes are really, really cheap. And you can do this um, pretty sensitively, but not as good as allele-specific PCR. So RFLP, I would say, let's uh, put less than 1% in terms of sensitivity here. RFLP, I would say around, depending on your capillary phresis system, 
two to five percent, I think, is where I would put it. So for cancer, it might be good enough. And so when we used to do DA35 FIT3 mutation genotyping, which is like receptor tyrosine kinase domain uh, point mutation, which is an activating mutation, we used to do it by RFLP, and this is around the, the sensitivity that we got. So what this means is that you can detect maybe two to five percent of mutant alleles present in a solution. Therefore, if you have a heterozygous mutation, activating mutation, going back to the very first lecture, you really need about four to 10 percent blast or tumor burden in order for you to detect it. Any questions about RFLP? It's still being used uh, quite a lot today. I think factor five Leiden uh, works for this assay. So one drawback I, I have to mention, what is the drawback of this assay? Right, so you have to have a sequence, a six base pair a sequence, an eight base pair sequence, or whatever the restriction enzyme recognizes that is uh, digestible by some enzyme that exists out there. So that's your limitation. There is a wide breadth in terms of variety of enzymes, but I would say it does not cover all possibilities. Because um, if you just did four to the six, that's a lot of restriction enzymes, right? I don't believe there's that many out there that have been cloned. These are typically from bacteria, by the way, and they have evolved to have these restriction enzymes. Do you know why? Viruses. Right. So phage uh, and things that kind of um, go and attack viruses will have these restriction sites. So it's sort of a, the, a bacterial immune system. It goes in and cleaves the foreign DNA, but keeps the, the, the native bacterial DNA intact. And, and that's, that's how it, it evolved to have that. OK, so we talked about two very, very cheap assays so far, right? allele-specific PCR and restriction fragment-linked polymorphism. So now let's talk about Sanger sequencing. So Sanger sequencing also involves PCR. So, so far, everything we talked about, like I mentioned, right, way back here in the FISH lecture, there's very rare in, in situ assays for genotyping. PCR base, PCR base, PCR base, PCR base, PCR base, PCR base. So we'll try to come full circle to the invader assay if I have time at the end, but let's do Sanger sequencing right now. PCR up front. And do you remember what goes into a PCR reaction? So some very quick key ingredients. So the template, right? You have your TAC polymerase. You have your forward reverse primer. DNTPs. Magnesium chloride and then some monovalent one, potassium, and then some buffer. Some folks add additives in to kind of make it a little bit more um, amenable for GC-rich regions, AT-rich regions, um, et cetera. But this is the core component here. So you do PCR first, but in Sanger sequencing, you have to do a crucial step of cleanup. Do you know what we're cleaning up here? Well, let's just say there's cleanup. We'll get back to that, okay? You clean up the reaction. And then you do a, a primer extension step, just the sequencing step. Here you use one primer in the forward or reverse, but not both. You have in there DNTPs, which allow you to do chain elongation, right? So I think we, in the PCL lecture, I mentioned about how primer extension is linear, right? And then how PCR is exponential. So here, let's say you have your template. Here's your primer. You add in DNTPs and it just kind of plops along because it has substrate, it has template, and the DNTPs will create a new daughter strand, the nascent DNA here. What is the crucial, crucial recipe, uh, ingredient in this recipe for Sanger sequencing? Yeah. So dideoxynucleotides. The difference between deoxynucleotides is that, let's say I add an A here that corresponds to, or is complementary to this T. There's a three prime hydroxyl group which allows me to go on and add another base. So a G comes in, has a five prime phosphate, sees the three prime hydroxyl group, is happy because now it can form a phosphodiester bond and elongates the chain. The G also has a three prime hydroxyl group, like that. So here is an A, I add a T, now let's say that I've added so much DNTPs, I mean DNTPs to DDNTPs, that at some kind of random st statistically, a st statistical um, sort of event here, that an egg is incorporated, but this time it has a three prime hydrogen instead of a three prime hydroxyl group. This thing is the DDNTP. 
This is called chain termination because there's no 3' hydroxyl group anymore for you to add on another base adjacent to that. And therefore, this thing halts. And you want to add more DNTPs to DDNTPs because you would like some elongation to occur before you have sort of that random stoppage. But it will do this along the way, every base, right? There are chances that at each individual base there will be a stoppage. So let's say this is... Um, <coughs> So there will be some fragments that end at the G, some that end at the C, some that end at A. And this will be a one base difference in terms of primer extension product. Okay? In the old days, what you do is you actually don't do this in one tube. You do this in four different tubes. You have all your DNTPs, A, T, C, and G, but you spike into each one of these individual tubes, maybe a D, D, A, T, P. DDTTP, DDCTP, and DDGTP. And in the old days, we didn't have the luxury of fluorescently labeled um, primers. We had radioactively labeled primers. So you would put the primers in, they're radioactively labeled, and where there's an A in this tube, there's going to be, so I'm going to draw it for this DATP, actually. No. I'm going to do it for this DCTP tube, okay? So the DCTP, DCTP tube, and I say that there's, there's stuff going on all the way back here, actually. So here's a primer. There's some chain elongation going on. So you'll have some products that will be stopping right here. Some that will stop that, that C. It won't stop at the G, right? So this is the complement strand, by the way, not, not the, the top strand. The top strand is here, right? So you have another product that would go all the way to the C, right? And that's it. So this is what's going on in this, this one tube right here. Something else will be going on in the DATP tube, right? DDATP. So here I'm going to draw again. So tube 1, which is the C, then tube 2, which is the A right here. So what you do is you run this on a huge polyacrylamide gel. Why polyacrylamide? And why huge? The right, the resolution. Polychromide is basically clear. Agrose is very opaque, so you can't uh, resolve things very well. And you need a huge thing because you need to separate the product so much so that you can actually uh, tell the difference between one base pair of difference between these products. So if you run it on a huge gel like this, this is A, T, C, G. Essentially, what you're running is you're using the radioactive dye, uh, label on the primers. And you're able to visualize what's going on, where things are stopping along the way here, in terms of the basis. So I draw this a little bit out of scale, but each one of these will be sort of different by one base. And what you do is you just go up this ladder, and you read A, C, T, C, G, uh, A, T, G, and so forth, and that's how you read the sequence. This would be the information from one of each, each of these tubes that tells you what halted the reaction in terms of the DDNTP that was involved in that tube, right? At what length it did it, and so the sizing is, is a way to see where in the template it stopped, and these are the complementary bases that uh, got terminated, or uh, that terminated the chain in terms of primer extension. Nowadays, we don't do this huge gel. You don't see that ever around anymore. Um, we have the luxury of having fluorescently labeled dyes uh, for primers, or for DNTPs for that matter. So what we do is we take that one primer, so here's the template, here's the primer, and we combine into one tube four different um, differentially labeled DDNTPs at a low ratio. So let's say A is this color, C is that color, G is that color, and I don't have blue, I do have blue, but then T is this color right there, like that. So you put that all into one tube, it's still at a low concentration relative to D and TPs, and so therefore when you go and do the reaction, things are going to go along in terms of the 
primary extension, then all of a sudden you add an A, for example, and that's the color that, that it is. You do the same thing, and all of a sudden you have a C, for example. But this is all going in the same tube. And the reason why you can do this in the same tube because it's a multiplex reaction with four different colors that you can differentiate. You run on capital electrophoresis system, uh, system, like the ABI system, and you can detect those four colors very easily. And these will be different roughly by one base, right? Like the N minus 1, N minus 2, N minus 3, kind of like the, this, this gel right here. And what you read out is essentially the blips. By capital electrophoresis, you'll see, I guess I need to get all of this up. <laughs> Green, orange, red. So when it comes out of the cap capillary atresis system, it's not going to be this nice actually. Things kind of migrate a little bit differently because of the dyes. So they kind of get crowded. But there's a software built in into the, um, the CE system that will be able to separate this, these out very nicely in terms of their size. So that it's kind of lined up like this. So you can just read now. T, A, A, T, G, T, A, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you look for a mutation, what you're looking for is something that doesn't belong there. So you'll see a sort of a, a, a smaller blip like this. Or if it's sort of a heterozygous mutation, it may be a little bit more balanced. So it, it might be a little bit taller like that. And the orange will compensate by being a little bit shorter. So you'll get a heterozygous mutation like that. On the opposite strand, you would expect, um, I'm going to draw this, so this is 5 prime to 3 prime. And I think I have to do this because if you don't know, learn about Sanger sequencing, it will be sort of a, a disgrace here. So help me figure this out. So I'm, I'm coming from the I have to read 5 prime to 3 prime, right? So this is the forward strand, and this is going to be the reverse strand. Let's say I start on the reverse strand here. This G is going to be a C, right? And then what? G, orange, orange. Orange, orange, yeah, the color will help. What else? Black. 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 Okay. Black and blue. Black and blue? No, orange and green. Yeah. yeah. But it's going to be different, right? So this green is corresponding to that orange, and that orange is corresponding to the green, right? The complementary. You kind of get the idea, right? So you would like to do this in the forward and reverse because it gives you uh, added confidence. That if you detect in the forward and detect in reverse, then you probably have a confident call. This is particularly true if you have, let's say, a mutation that's really tiny. So say my green here, a tiny blip like that. And then here on the green side, you get a tiny corresponding orange blip. So if you see this scenario, you're going to be a little more confident. And this is what you'll see in cancer in terms of genotyping. OK, so let's circle back. And complete this, because I forgot the fourth step. There's another cleanup step. It's called a big dye cleanup. And it's to clean up the, the dyes here that, that's involved in, in the DDNTPs. And the reasoning is th these tend to be kind of sticky. They're highly charged. So they kind of stick to your fragments and really cloud the picture during CE analysis. So you want to clean the, this up by the big dye clip kit. You can do it by uh, sort of a cephalose column. You can do it by ethanol precipitation. Any way to wash out the free non-bound DDNTPs is what you're trying to do here. There are alternative ways of doing the cleanup, which I'll, I'll cover in snapshot. But for now, why do I, what do I need to clean up here in the second step? I kind of left this blank. Primers and DNTPs. Right. So you need to clean out the primers, and you need to clean out the DNTPs. So two reasons. One is that I mentioned to you that you should only add one primer into this reaction, right? Because you would only want to look at things that are terminating respective to this one template. If you have a second primer into there, or worse, if you have some off-target, so this is on-target here. Let's say you have some remaining 
this is the forward primer, some remaining reverse primer, or something that's off target. So here's a reverse primer, or even a forward primer that's binding off target. If this contribu contributes some primer extension and then some chain termination event, what you get out is a garbled look, almost like you have a mutation there. But it's going to be very junky, hard to interpret, and mumble jumble. So that's why it's absolutely necessary to clean up the primers at this step. The DNTPs is not so crucial, but it's nice to clean that up. And usually if you do like 35, 40 cycles, you would have exhausted quite a bit of the DNTPs. This right here would overwhelm me. But the main reason to get rid of it is to not uh, throw off the ratio here. These ratios, when you order the reagents, are designed to be, say, 500 base pair read length or 200 base pair read length. So the, how would you get, if I have a 500 base pair kit versus a 200 base pair kit, what is the difference, the ratio? Let's say DNTPs relative to DDNTPs. How, how would you design this so that you could get longer elongation? Which one is going to be higher? So if I give you a number, say the ratio is 10 here, I'm just throwing this out, what would you expect in the 500 base pair kit? <coughs> Something higher than this. Does that make sense? Because this ratio, this has to be much less to allow you the chance for further chain elongation, less chain termination. So these kits are designed to be of a certain ratio, so if you were to carry this over from the prior reaction, it could throw it off and not get you the ideal 200 or 500 that you're looking for. On a good day, you can probably get up to six, 700 base pair read link uh, on a CE system using uh, Sanger sequencing. So that's where that, this cleanup step comes into play. And this is the final one that I mentioned to you about, right? So alternative ways of cleaning this up, uh, you can do a column. You can just do a column. You can do ethanol precipitation here as well. Just anything to get rid of and wash out all of this small junk here. These are rather small, so you can get rid of them pretty easily. Your PCR product is double-stranded and large, 200 bases, 500 bases. So this is quite an, an easy task to do. But other ways of doing it enzymatically is you can use something called EXO, nuclease 1. And anybody know what this cleaves? Single stranded DNA. Yeah. So the single stranded DNA that is cleaving is what? Primers. The primers. Those are single stranded oligos. Your PCR amplicon should be double stranded and remain intact. Trent alkaline phosphatase. Let us know what this does. Phosphatase means it's going to remove your phosphate group from the 5' prime end. So what it does is it doesn't really nuke this, but it takes away the 5' prime phosphate so that it doesn't participate in chain elongation. So it's sort of a way of cleaning it in solution but without really getting rid of it. Uh, it's still flowing around, but it's sort of decapitated or handicapped because it's missing the 5' prime phosphate. And another way is to clean this up um, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in the end, actually. So let's ask a very simple question now. Let's say I do this, then all of a sudden, I don't know, my manufacturer, ABI, forgets to add DNTPs to this stuff. Here's my template. Here's my primer. What happens? You get the snapshot. You get snapshot. Do folks understand that? Single base extension. All right. So this is called single base extension or snap. Let's spell this right. Snip. Snapshot. Or the other, I think I, I mentioned snapshot. <laughs> See, <Snapchat>. the other, <laughs> the other uh, pronunciation for this, right? So. <laughs> DDNTPs get all added to here, an A gets incorporated, it has a 3' hydroxyl group, it's going nowhere else. It's only focused on that first base, and that's what snapshot is. There's really no other magic to it. So this one, we tend to like exonuclease and SAP to do the cleanup because you can automate it. It gets, um, can be easily handled by a um, liquid handler. The cleanup step in the end here usually involves a SAP step only. And this is just to take away the phosphate group, which tends to make it sticky with all of the other um, fragments, uh, single strand fragments that are around. 
and so therefore it renders it sort of incapable of mig co-migrating with, with your, your products. Why do I not want to use Excel here? Because if you only have primaries in one direction, you're going to have a single strand of DNA. Right. Okay. So if you use Excel 1, you'll get rid of all of these right here, which will be an excess, right? Primer extension, linear, you're producing single-stranded products off of this one template here. Questions so far for snapshot? Okay, so sensitivity. Sanger, single base extension or snapshot. 20 to 25 percent allele sensitivity. I'll say one to five percent. Sometimes one to ten, depending on what, what the allele is. So for cancer, this is much better. Uh, cancer, not so great, right? So if it's something 20 or 25 percent, you're going to need like 40 or 50 percent tumor cellularity. But here you can probably get down to 10 percent, and you might be okay uh, for a Sanger I mean, for a snapshot. Snapshot. How do you get multiplexing? So the way you get multiplexing is the very first step, the PCR, you're going to do multiplex PCR, right? So you're just going to throw into there maybe eight sets of primers that will amplify up eight targets. You have eight templates waiting for extension. You add into there your extension primers that you're interested in genotyping that one base that you're looking for. So this has an A, a T, C, A, T. So right now, these look very similar in size, right? So the way you trick the system in order to get separation of these products is to use further elongating primer like that, the linker. So spatially, you're going to resolve them. And each one of these is going to have a certain color, right, because the DDNTPs are fluorescently labeled. And you'll be able to spatially resolve what is being genotyped there. And then what you're looking for are bins outside of this where things tend to fall. The dyes, the bases that it in with have, has different mass, different charge, so, so therefore you get sort of a little bit of shift. They all don't line up perfectly for you at this one size right here. And so they're a little bit shifted, and that explains why when you look at, at a raw Sanger sequencing trace, it's also very mumble jumble. And that's why you need the software to clean up the alignment just a little bit for you to, to make the read and the call. So that's it. That's all I have to say about snapshot. It's, it's actually a, an older technique developed in 2001 by Eric Landers' group over at the, um, at the time, I guess the bro wasn't there yet, but he was at the Whitehead, I believe. So he developed that because there was no SNP arrays around, and he needed to genotype thousands of SNPs in, in mice. And uh, this way, along with capillotresis, allowed him to, to do that without having to rely on an array-type system. Alrighty, we have 10, 12 minutes, right? This clock is fast, no? 15 minutes, right? Yep. 15? I can squeeze right at 3? <laughs> sure. Um, let's see, what can we talk about? Let's wrap up some of the other ones really, really quick. There is, um, let's stick with PCR still, okay? Melting curve analysis. Actually, let's do an old technique first. Single-stranded confirmation polymorphism. So th what this is, is you do a PCR of your target, and you run it on a polyacrylamide gel, which is denaturing. So here's your gel. Let's say I run a wild-type control. So what this is going to do is kind of melt off the two strands, right, the product. You, you design a PCR for 200 base pairs, for example. So that product is going to melt off, and one of the strands is going to run a certain way, and the other is going to look a little bit different. It looks kind of like that. If you have a mutation in your PCR product, so let's say there's a mutation here, and this works pretty well if you have, say, a deletion of, of some base here. So you have your, your patient, and, and Yi would probably be very familiar with this. No, maybe not. <laughs> What this, hap what this does is that it changes the conformation. The, the, the base is different, the charge is different, so therefore it's going to migrate through the polychromide gel differentially. So you might have something that looks slightly different in terms of the way it's stained. So you do the polychromide gel and you stain it. 
Um, I think you usually use a silver stain, right? Because it's more sensitive. And so you're looking at a basically a morphological molecular assay for looking for screening for mutations in PCR amplipods. So you would do this step up front and then throw this into Sanger sequencing to find the mutation that you're looking for. So it's sort of a screening assay because probably nine times out of ten, the patients that you're testing are going to be negative for that. So they're going to consistently look something like this. But when you see something slightly off and different, this is what you suspect is uh, mutated, and therefore you send it for Sanger sequencing. I don't really know what the sensitivity of this is because um, there's probably things that form, kind of bridges and heteroduplexes. Uh, there may be the way the, um, the DNA comes together and forms hairpins and stuff, changes the way it migrates. So I really don't know what the sensitivity of this assay is. But it's an old technique of screening for mutations in amplicons. Not used much anymore. Um, it's a very labor intensive one because the, the reading is quite difficult. And what do you think, you sometimes subjective? <laughs> I only do it once. So. Okay. <laughs> so that's SCP. A better method to do this is to do PCR. So, so far, it's still PCR. Melting curve analysis. You do PCR and you add into there, and you can actually add the dye directly into the PCR reaction without cleaning up. A cyber green dye or a pico green dye, some dye that binds specifically to double stranded DNA. At the very end of the PCR cycle, you're going to do a melting curve analysis. So you're going to start low and then go high in terms of temperature. So, I don't know, maybe around 50 degrees, all the way up to 95 or something like that. And during this step, you're going to be monitoring how the dye behaves in terms of binding to the DNA. So it's sort of like the real-time assays, and therefore a lot of these assays are actually done in real-time PCR machines, because it already has a built-in function for detecting the fluorescence, and you just need to tell it to do a melting curve analysis and register what the fluorescence is during um, the cycle right here. So when you do this, what happens is that the... Get my black marker. So let's say this is um, intensity, which is typically RFUs of the dye, and this is temperature, and it's increasing. So at a low temperature, you're going to have mostly double-stranded product, right? That's annealed together, double-stranded DNA, PCR amplicons, and it's going to start off pretty high like that. But at some point, the temperature gets so warm and hot that it drops, and then it melts everything into single-stranded form. So you can have a curve like this. Now, if you have a mutation, let's say you have another amplicon which has a point mutation, but better yet, a deletion is even easier to detect uh, here. What happens is it changes the melting uh, behavior of this amplicon or product. Like even a slight change, let's say a C to an A, for example, there, can have a, quite a drastic change. And so therefore, it would shift the melting curve one way or the other. And when you do that, perhaps it looks kind of like this. Let me draw a. Let me draw another color. How about that? So let's say somehow this mutation increases the um, melting nature of, of the product. These are pure samples, pure wild type, and pure mutant. Now, if you have a mixed sample like heterozygous mutation or a cancer sample, it's going to be sort of an, an in-between stage between these two. So I'll draw that in red, okay? So this thing is going to melt off first. Then, you see how, how the, the shape kind of changes? It's sort of an average between the two, depending on the cellularity of the disease cells that you're looking for. So it has this sort of funky shape right here. And this is a little bit more objective and I wouldn't say it's quantitative, but it's more objective than SAP and probably way more sensitive because it's using fluorescent dye to detect this melting curve analysis. It doesn't tell you, um, by a simple design, it doesn't tell you what mutation is there. But you can go on and do Sanger sequencing as a follow-up study to find the mutation. So it's sort of a screening assay. So there are ways you can design this to be actually allele specific. And what you can do is add a third oligo 
into here, in addition to your forward and reverse primer, that will bind to this region specifically. So a very short one, 20 mer, 30 mer, that would recognize this A or this C right here. And that will differently ch differentially change this, the way the shape looks. And you can use that information to tell whether or not you have this mutation in here, like a point mutation. A little bit trickier to design. Um, there's a company that makes a light scanner tool, uh, which does this. And it's rather cheap to run. You just set up the PCR reaction, you design your primers, and you just have this dye. This is a very non-specific dye that will work for any amplicon. So I think at some point, if your amplicon is too big, like say 500 or 1,000 bases, it probably is going to fail because that will be a minor change, right, in terms of melting curve analysis. But if you design your, your amplicons to be, say, 200, 150, I think it's very amenable and very differently changed if you have a mutation there. So that's um, melting curve analysis. Some people argue that it's rather sensitive, maybe down to the snapshot level. Um, I've heard some even going beyond that, but I probably would say it's around the snapshot level of sensitivity. Any other PCR assays out there that you guys can think of? What's that? Higher sequencing. Okay, let's quickly go through that in two minutes, because I'll cover it again in next-gen sequencing as well. Higher sequencing, PCR. Clean up. Here's your template, right? You're going to add into there one primer, not two, again. You have to clean up the forward or reverse primer. Let's say I add this primer into here. Only one primer. I'm only genotyping that. So this, um, what you add into there are DNTPs, A, T, C, G. But you add them in succession, one at a time. So you add an A. So let's say you add an A, right? And this is looking for a C. You add an A. Nothing happens, right? There's no incorporation, dead, nothing happens. You add a T, nothing happens. So I'm going to draw the blip, the, the activity here. Nothing happens, nothing happens. This is what you're injecting down here. You add a C, okay? C gets incorporated, what falls out? What else? We'll talk about this in next gen. Pyrophosphate in the presence of aryl sulfurylase gets converted into ATP. ATP plus oxygen plus D luciferin plus firefly luciferase, or what I call bug juice from fireflies, will give you light. So it's a cascade, right? This has to get incorporated, that has to be converted into ATP, and then this reaction has to generate a few photons that you can detect. So you add it to C. Yep, I got a blip of light activity. I add a G, let's say T is next, no activity. So you basically go on and do this, and you'll be able to sequence this in real time. This is different, right? Real time versus, um, versus Sanger, which is a uh, endpoint assay. You do all of the extensions first, and then you analyze the products. Here, you're analyzing the product in real time. And so you can imagine how you can get mutations, maybe it's supposed to be a C here, um, but then you do get a blip at the T. That's actually a mutation. That's a base that's been converted. A little bit trickier to analyze. Two minutes, right? <laughs> yes, no problem. <laughs> Invader. Very fast. Um, mutation here. Design an invader probe. Then you have this going on versus something that doesn't get recognized and you form something else here. So this, there's a probe here that if it recognizes this little kink, it's a tripartite kind of structure due to this invader kind of busy stuff going on at this juncture, depending if you have the mutation or not. So this is the allele specific part right here. Flip base is an enzyme that will cleave this, kind of like restriction enzyme digests. It frees this up so that this becomes an invader or yet another oligo that you put into the system that has another sort of thing going on here. And this gets cleaved, and this has a quencher and a fluorescent probe, or fluorescent dye. And you can do multiplexes with two, like maybe an oligo here that's uh, specific for the wild type and another oligo specific for the mutant. You do this in a reaction, and over time, this is, there's no PCR here. 
You take the DNA as it is, maybe 500 nanograms, I think. Let it go for three hours, and you accumulate single signal that's red or green that will correspond to your wild type or your mutant. I finished. <laughs> <laughs>